So imagine you have two people that want to communicate with each other, but there's a person in between eavesdropping on the conversation. If they wish to communicate at all, they must first pass the message to the man in the middle, who will continue to read the message before passing it along. Is there any way that they can communicate if they wish to keep their messages secret from the man in the middle? While the world of encryption is incredibly complex, the main problem it's trying to solve really is this simple. Although the internet is mostly made up of clients and servers just looking to communicate innocently without intercepting anyone's data, your traffic is still bouncing off of several locations across the globe, and you can never be fully sure that people aren't listening in. There are several actors who might have plenty to gain by listening in on communications, such as service providers, spying agencies, and other hackers. Given that there's no real way of verifying that channels of communication are secure, every message being sent across the internet should be done so assuming that people might be listening in. This is where encryption comes into play. So how do you encrypt messages? If you haven't thought about this problem before, you might find it to be harder than you think. Even if you could come up with some creative way of jumbling up a message, maybe something like a Caesar cipher, you would still need to communicate to the receiver how they could unjumble it. The only issue there is that anybody listening in could first intercept your explanation of how to unjumble your message, and then intercept your jumbled messages and unjumble them. No matter how complicated your cipher is, or how many layers deep you encode, a persistent eavesdropper will always be equally likely to decode a message as your receiver would be. The more you think about this problem, the more you might start to convince yourself that it's impossible to solve. And you may actually be correct, as there are no mathematically perfect solutions to this problem. There are, however, a few pragmatic methods that make communication effortless between two parties and virtually impossible to crack by an eavesdropper. One such method is called RSA. So before I go into the fine details of RSA, I want to give a brief summary of how asymmetric cryptography works in general. It starts by somebody doing some math, and the output of that math is basically just some numbers that we'll be referring to as public and private keys. Keep in mind that these keys are generated without any communication, so they can be kept a complete secret until this person decides to share them. Next, the public key is going to be shared with the person you're attempting to communicate with. As the name suggests, this key is not a secret, and it doesn't matter who's able to see it. Now keep in mind, this person also has a message, and we'll assume that this message is a secret, and they haven't shared it with the outside world yet. At this point, they can do some math with the public key they received, and their secret message to produce an encrypted version of their message. This encrypted message can safely be sent back, and anyone from the outside world who sees it won't be able to do anything with it. The only person who can decrypt this message is the person holding the private key. The original sender can then do some basic math using the private key and the encrypted message to produce the secret message in plain text. With this, these parties were successfully able to share a secret message. Even if somebody was listening in the whole time, they would only have access to the public key and the encrypted message, and that's simply not enough to determine the secret message in plain text. So now, let's go step by step and talk about the math behind each of the processes. It all starts with our original sender who wants to generate the public-private key pair. They must first select two different prime numbers, called P and Q. Let's use 29 and 41 for now. These numbers aren't large enough for RSA to be secure, but they're good enough for this example. There are efficient ways of choosing very large prime numbers that can be used in practice, but we'll talk about that later. For now, you can just randomly pick two primes. Next, multiply these two numbers together. We'll call this number n. Now we're going to calculate Carmichael's totient function of n, or lambda of n. Luckily, in the case of RSA, this is always simply equal to the least common multiple of p minus 1 and q minus 1. There's a pretty nice procedural way of calculating least common multiples, and I'll quickly go through it for those of you who don't know. First, we can rewrite the least common multiple in terms of the greatest common denominator, then simply plug in p minus 1 and q minus 1. Greatest common denominator has a really clean way of being calculated as well. Simply start with the two numbers and keep replacing the larger number with the difference between the numbers. For example, here we can replace the 40 with a 12, then replace the 28 with a 16, so on and so forth until the two numbers remaining are the same. If you want to be a little bit more efficient, you can use the larger number mod the smaller number instead of subtraction. Either way, the matching number pair you are left with at the end will be your answer. So we can replace the greatest common denominator with our answer of 4, and calculate the product to obtain the least common multiple. So just like that, we now have the value for lambda of n. I should also point out that this procedure is efficient even if we were working with very large values, so there aren't any issues with scaling. Next, we're going to choose a value for e. e can be any number between 1 and lambda of n, as long as it is coprime to lambda of n, so it's usually easiest just to pick a prime number. 
There are some basic guidelines for choosing E, but it doesn't really matter too much as you'll see, so we'll just pick 19 here. Lastly, we're going to calculate D. Now D is the weird one. The correct way of saying this is that D is the modular multiplicative inverse of E modulo lambda of n. And if you're like me, then that probably doesn't mean anything to you if it's your first time hearing it, but it can be written in a way that might make more sense to you. D must solve the equation so that D times E is congruent to 1 modulo lambda of n. And even that was difficult for me to think about at first, so a really easy way of thinking about it is D is the smallest number where D times E minus 1 is divisible by lambda of n. For some reason, I had to think about it like that to really understand what I was solving for. But anyway, no matter how you think of it, there's a nice procedural way of solving for this as well. So I'll step through that now. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the greatest common denominator of e and lambda of n. This might seem odd since we know that the answer must be 1, as 19 is prime, and 280 is not divisible by 19. However, the work we uncover upon performing this calculation is important in the next step. Since we already covered this earlier, I'll just list out the pairs here, and I'll use modulus instead of subtraction to make it more efficient. Feel free to stop as soon as the difference between the numbers is equal to 1. Next, you're going to work from bottom up and express 1 as the difference between these numbers, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So 1 is obviously the difference between 5 and 4, and I'll keep the numbers from the left column in parentheses to avoid confusion. The weird spacing and coefficients of 1 may seem odd now, but as we continue it'll make more sense. Moving up, we're going to have the numbers in parentheses match the values from our GCD calculation. Keep the coefficient on the number that just changed the same, and you can write the other coefficient as x, since that one is going to change. We can solve for x to find that it is exactly equal to 3. If you've done everything correctly, x should always be an integer. Now we're going to move up and do the same thing. This time we'll be keeping the 3 coefficient and replacing the other one. Upon solving for x, you'll find that it is equal to 4. Do this one final time. Keep the 4 and we'll be replacing the 3. After solving for x, we find that the answer is 59. This final coefficient is the value of d. And we can check by seeing that 59 times 19 minus 1 is in fact divisible by 280, as this final line shows. So now that we have the value of d, we have finished key generation. And we should probably talk about which numbers are public and which are private. The public key is actually made up of two numbers n and e, while the private key is just the value of d. As far as encryption and decryption are concerned, these are the only numbers we need moving forward. All the other math was just needed to help us get there. Okay, so now let's talk about how to use these keys for encrypting and decrypting messages. Let's imagine that one party has a secret message of the number 123. Secrets can be text as well, but all text is encoded as binary, and the binary encoding would basically just be treated like a number anyway. It's important to point out that the message cannot be larger than the value of n, but this is just a small example, so in the real world, n would be larger and much less limiting. Since this person will also have been sent the public key, they can encrypt their message by performing the following operation. The message is encrypted by raising it to the power e and taking mod n. While this exponentiation seems like it would produce some massive numbers if we were to scale up, there are actually efficient ways of performing modulus on exponents without having to deal with the full result. It's called modular exponentiation, and it's actually very fast. Now, 451 is the encrypted message, and it can safely be sent back to the party who generated the key pair for it to be decrypted. Now, the decryption formula is pretty similar to the encryption formula, with the major difference being that it requires the private key. Since the party who generated the keys is the only person who has the private key, they should be the only person capable of decrypting the message. Now, if all of our math was done correctly, the decrypted message should perfectly match the original secret message and we can see here that it does. Now, of course, this video would not be complete if we didn't talk about cracking, especially since the numbers used in our example were small and our encryption would be fairly easy to crack. So let's assume that an eavesdropper is able to obtain the values of n and e because they're public, but d is kept well hidden. If they want to decrypt the messages, they'll need to figure out the value of d somehow. If we work backwards through the math, we'll see that lambda of n is required to calculate d given e, and of course, p and q are required to calculate lambda of n. And n is public. So all that somebody would need to do to crack this encryption would be to decompose the value of n into its two prime factors, and then d could be easily calculated. So that leaves us asking the obvious question, what stops somebody from cracking RSA? The answer is, factoring is hard. It's really that simple. The heart of RSA is based on the fact that multiplying two large prime numbers together is easy, 
but factoring a large number into its two prime constituents is hard. Think about it. If I gave you the public value of n and asked you to factor it into its two prime constituents, what procedure would you use? You'd have to perform some kind of brute force guess and check type method. And that works here because this number is small. So it probably wouldn't take you very long to figure out that it's 29 times 41. But what about this number? Were you able to figure out that these are its factors? Or this number? Or this number? Do you think that you could write a program to tell me that these are the factors? Even if you could, this is still much smaller than what's actually used in practice. If there's any lesson that you take from this video, it's that everything else we've talked about scales really nicely. Key generation, encryption, and decryption are all composed of math that only gets slightly harder as the parameters get bigger. Cracking is the one thing that has absolutely no way of being done procedurally, and as the parameters get larger, the difficulty increases exponentially. If the parameters get large enough, the amount of memory and clock cycles that a computer would require to crack the private key becomes completely infeasible. But don't trust me, trust the industry. Okay, so here I have Reddit open in Google Chrome. And if we want to see how Reddit encrypts traffic, we'll click on this lock icon here and we can view its certificate. So we'll take a look at the details. And what we're most interested in is this public key info here. We can see that Reddit does use RSA encryption. It lists the public key, this is the value of n, and here's the exponent, which is the value of e. This is a very common value of e. And if we look, we see that the key size is 2048 bits, or 256 bytes. And I'll show you what that looks like. This is in hexadecimal format, but if we were to put this number into decimal format, it would be over 600 digits long. So good luck finding the prime factors of that, and if you can, you can crack all of Reddit's internet traffic. All right, so that's all I have. Hopefully you guys were able to get a good understanding of RSA. I myself had a lot of trouble learning it, so I hope I was able to break the math down in a way that's easy to understand. If you enjoyed the video, remember to like and share. And if you want to see more videos like this in the future, consider subscribing. Thanks, everyone.